Chapter 1 The General Conception of a Dragon No one has ever seen a living dragon because the wagons do not exist. Most of us, however, have a very fair conception of what a dragon is supposed to look like having often seen pictures or representations of such fearsome beasts. For instance, engravings of the dragon which was encountered by St George may be seen on the reverse of some of our gold and silver coins, and on the front of pound notes. The dragon is merely a fabulous animal, that is, a creature of the imagination and the early traditions of the human race are full of the most curious stories in which a leading part is taken by dragons. Although those primitive, unlettered and wonder-loving people of early times were unfettered and altogether unrestricted by existing facts and gave free play to their imaginations in building up descriptions of the fabled monster, their accounts generally agreed in quite a number of the qualities that a dragon was supposed to possess. First of all, a dragon was always of immense size and strength, and very frightful to behold, a monster in fact, although, like the crawling serpent of the reptile family, he always had four legs but both his tail and his head were elongated to snake-like proportions, and he was further inclined towards the same class of animals in being covered with tough scales, in having poisonous fangs and a stinging tail, and in affecting slimy ways in desert wastes. Then, in addition, he was armed with terrible claws and had wings wherewith to pursue and overtake his enemies. Sometimes he had a barbed tail and a barbed tongue, and often he breathed out scorching, fiery breath. Yet, though possessed of legs like a quadruped and of wings like a bird, he always remained essentially a reptile of the serpent class. An old Latin proverb said, Unless a serpent eats a serpent, it will not become a dragon. Indeed, Dragons are, as Barham, one of our humorous poets, puts it, such great ugly things, all legs and wings, with nasty long tails, armed with nasty stings. The dragon's quest is to be feared, says another Latin proverb. It is the darting, poisonous quest, with the coiling, strangling tail of the dragon, which show his kindred to the serpent. All reptiles appear to be so less natural than other animals that man is always disposed to regard them with dislike. In the ancient romance of chivalrous knighthood, Sir Percival, in one of his adventures in the quest of the Holy Grail, comes upon a lion fighting with a serpent who had stolen its cubs and, says the old tale, regarding the lion as the more natural beast of the two, he determined to help it. He drew his sword and slew the serpent, whereupon the grateful lion fawned upon him and followed him like a spaniel, couching at his feet when he lay down to sleep at night. We can readily think of a lion becoming a tame, domesticated animal, but we cannot very easily reconcile ourselves to the notion of warming a frozen snake in one's bosom, which... Indeed, the man in the fable found to be a very unwise thing to do. The Bible has many allusions to the serpent, to its poisonous nature, its sharp tongue and its dreadful bite. In addition to which, it is said in the Old Testament to be subtle and in the New to be wise. So subtle was it that it beguiled man to his fall. The prophet Isaiah speaks of a fiery flying serpent and in the book of Revelation we read of a great dragon, the old serpent called the devil and Satan which deceiveth the whole world. So we have in this text the important idea of a connecting link between the serpent and the dragon. The dragon 
seems to be a glorified serpent. A super serpent. A serpent with added terrors. In fact, the two creatures appear to be the same and their names interchangeable. As something, according to scripture, to be trampled on. As something to be slain without hesitation or remorse. Also, something owing to its great cunning to be very wary of. For Shakespeare, our sovereign poet, says, Come not between the dragon and its wrath. If you go into an old parish church, you may sometimes see an ancient tomb with a figure of a person buried beneath carved in stone or alabaster, represented in the costume of the period, often a knight in armour, or it may be a priest in his clerical robes. At the feet of this recumbent effigy, some animal is nearly always represented as lying as a lion or a dog, but if the person commemorated as a dignitary of the church, the carving is invariably that of a dragon. This is in symbolic allusion to Psalm 111.13. The young lion and the dragon shalt thou tread under thy feet. Now, why is it that by whatever name this creature is called, it is always to be attacked and, if possible, to be overcome and slain? Is it simply because it is the symbol or sign of evil? It may be of sin or sometimes it may even stand for some bodily evil like plague and pestilence. But in whatever guise or wherever placed, the dragon is generally taken for some evil which threatens mankind, either in his soul or in his bodily health. Among all eastern nations, much use is made of language which is not to be taken literally or according to the letter, but is to be interpreted in a figurative sense. That is, a language in which one thing stands for another. For instance, in the parable of our Lord, we have to interpret the seed to mean the word of God. The good ground to mean the hearts of good men and the bad ground to signify the hearts of wicked men. But in the same way, in all these old tales and legends, we frequently have to accept a dragon as meaning some deadly, evil, monstrous and vile threatening to humankind, coming out of its hidden lurking places at unexpected times and then devouring and desolating everything before it. Therefore, it is that when any champion more bold and daring than his fellows has deliberately set forth and achieved some noble and mighty deed which delivered a person or a people from an affliction under which they were always suffering or an overwhelming calamity which was always threatening to overtake them. He has been reckoned among the glorious and worshipful band of dragon-slaying heroes and as such noble deeds have naturally won the blessing of the church, quite a number of dragon slayers are to be found in the ranks of the saints. The name dragon is said to have come from a word meaning to see or to watch and to have been given to the monster which was not only winged and armed with enormous claws but had set in its crested head the most fiery and watchful of eyes. In this sense, therefore, a dragon is understood to be a creature which is fiercely and spitefully watchful above all others. In this connection, many tales of old romance tell of watchful dragons being employed as a guardians of hidden treasures, or, more frequently, of beautiful ladies imprisoned within the walls of enchanted castles. Old feudal castles had great winding walls round them and inner walls again enclosing the central stronghold, the securest place to keep captives and the safest place for defenders. Perhaps the romances meant to show that when the adventurous attackers had scaled such serpentine walls and at last gained access to the imprisoned ladies or the guarded treasure, they had overcome guardian dragons.